Hello and welcome back to Artful Bytes and to another video in a series of videos where I'm programming an embedded system from scratch or more specifically this Sumo robot. I've already done two videos where I introduce my robot and talk about the parts it's made up of so if you want to know more go check them out. In the last video I went over the parts I picked out for this project and in this video I want to zoom in on the PCB design I made to connect all the parts. I know I've said that this video series is primarily going to be about programming but as I also said in the previous video, when doing embedded systems programming, it's essential that we understand the hardware and that's why I'm spending some time on it before we actually get to the programming. I want to go through this pretty briefly, so this video is not going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to design a PCB like this. My intention is just to give you an overview before I dive into the specifics in the coming programming videos. So let's now jump over to my desk and get started. First of all, if you're not familiar with PCBs, PCB stands for Printed Circuit Board and it's what all electronics devices use these days to connect their components because it makes it possible to connect many small components in a space efficient and reliable way and makes mass manufacturing and mass production possible. So when working on embedded systems you will inevitably come in contact with PCBs even if you're primarily focusing on the software and writing the code for a computer chip on a PCB. You will still need to know how to parse schematics and do basic hardware analyzing and perhaps patching. So it's important to have a good understanding of them. Manufacturing a PCB was once a costly or messy endeavor, mostly accessible to companies with money. But in the recent decade, it has become accessible to hobbyists as well. With the advent of manufacturers like GLC PCB and PCBWay, it has now become possible to have small batches of boards made for a few tens of dollars and even have the components assembled for you. The PCB I designed for this Sumobot is a pretty simple board. It's a small 5x6 cm two layer board with one layer for the signals and the other for ground. There are no high frequency signals and overall it has few components. I designed it in KiCad which is a popular open source program for designing PCBs. If you're interested, I put my keycard files including the schematic and PCB layout in a GitHub repository. You find the link in the description. I had it manufactured at the ALC PCB twice because the first time around I made some silly mistakes so I had to do a second revision of the board and so the board I have on my robot now is the second revision. Having five of these boards manufactured including some of the components assembled set me back around $50. Adding it up with the components I sold it myself I would say that a board cost me around $60 to $70 so pretty accessible for a hobbyist indeed. One thing I want to clarify before I go over the schematic is that I didn't go from choosing the parts, the motors, the sensors and so on straight to designing the PCB. I first prototyped everything using a solderless board and breakout boards along with the evaluation board for my microcontroller. And I actually did quite a lot of programming before I went ahead and designed the PCB. And in the coming videos I will be writing most of the drivers using the prototype boards and the evaluation board for my microcontroller before I move over to the PCB. Okay, so what I'm showing here is the schematic of my PCB and it's a drawing that shows the components and how they are connected together. When doing embedded systems programming, it's the schematic and not the PCB layout you will be interested in most of the time because you will want to know which pin is connected to which pin. If you want to program a better system, reading a schematic is an important skill and I think the best way to learn it is to actually design a PCB yourself because then all these surrounding passive components, the bypass caps and so on, will make more sense. Or I at least found it easier to parse schematics after I had designed my own PCB. Anyway, so getting into it, let's start at the power end of things in the top left corner. There is a bunch of components that need power and I only have one power source, the two single cell LiPo batteries, which gives me a voltage of 7.4. Okay, so these two batteries hook into two battery connectors. Uh, it's these connectors uh, right here and then I have a simple power switch to easily switch the power on and off which is this switch here and after the switch I have a MOSFET for reverse polarity protection which prevents me from frying up the board in case I connect the battery in the wrong direction and it's this MOSFET right here Almost all of the components I connect uh, expect 3.3 voltage on their input except for the motors which have their voltage handled by the motor drivers that vary the voltage to control the speed of the motors. And this means that I can't connect the power source, my batteries, directly to most of the components. This means I have to regulate down the 7.4 volt from the batteries down to 3.3 volt. And to do this I have two regulator circuits. 
one switching buck regulator that takes the 7.4 volt down to 5 volt and then a linear regulator circuit that takes the 5 volt down to 3.3 volt. This is the switching regulator circuit and this is the linear regulator. The reason I did it like this is because I initially thought that I needed 5 volt for the line sensors and it wasn't until after the first revision that I realized they could also be powered with 3.3 volt. But to avoid risking making a mistake in the second revision I kept it like this and this means I'm actually not using the 5 volt from the switching regulator for anything besides putting it into the line A regulator to get the 3.3 volt. But I believe that having two regulators like this also gives me some extra protection against the noise from the motors. Of course, dropping 5V down to 3.3V with a linear regulator is not optimal. It's a bit wasteful and produces some extra heat. But since the current through the regulator is pretty small, I still get by without putting on a heatsink. As for the switching regulator circuit, there is quite a lot of surrounding components here. But I've just mostly followed the example diagram in the datasheet of the switching regulator. But I've put a fuse here for some extra protection, as well as an LED for visual aid during bring up. Similarly, the line regulator has surrounding components for stability. Here I also put a fuse for protection as well as an LED for visual aid. Starting from scratch again, I think I would have replaced these two regulators with a single switching regulator. Yes, the liner regulator provides a more stable voltage output, but I think I could have gotten away with that because I don't have any super sensitive high precision ADC or anything like that. And that's pretty much it for the power. The 3.3 volt then goes to several components, perhaps most importantly the microcontroller, the MSP430 28 pin version. Okay, so I have the 3.3 volt coming in here on the input, along with two bypass caps to reduce the noise, and the pull up resistor on the reset line because it's active low, so unless I pull it up, the microcontroller will reset indefinitely. I also have a small switch here so that I can reset the microcontroller physically without having to power switch the entire board. Okay, so looking at the actual PCB, the microcontroller is placed here and the switch here. And the rest is just all the connected pins that I've ordered carefully to make sure that they support the function that I need them to. For example, the I2C lines, the data line and clock line are connected to port 1 on pin 6 and 7 because that's the line that has the I2C peripheral. And since only port 1 and port 2 are interrupt capable on the 28 pin version of the MSP430, I have made sure to put the uh, pins that require interrupts on port 1 and port 2. It's mainly these two, the interrupt line from one of the range sensors, as well as the pin from the IR receiver. And the pins from the line sensors must be connected to uh, port 1, because it's only the pins on port 1 that can be mixed to the ADC peripheral. And the PVM signals for the motor drivers are connected here because I use timer A0 to produce the PVM signals and so on and so on. Maybe it's also worth mentioning the UART pins which I use to send log traces to my host computer but more on that later in the programming videos. On the left here are the connectors for the range sensors which all have 5 pins connected to them. 3.3 uh, volt, ground, I2C lines and a pin to reset them. So quite a lot of pins for these. They actually have one additional pin, the interrupt pin, but I've only connected the interrupt pin to one of them. Because when I'm using several of them in parallel, it's enough for me to know when one of them finish with the measurement. Because then the other ones will have finished already or will finish soon after. And this saves me a couple of pins. And the connectors for the range sensors are here, 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 and here, and here. And then we have the connectors for the line detectors, uh, which only have three pins, power, ground, and the one that is connected to the ADC channel. I've also put the LED on each one, which makes it possible for me to physically see when the line is detected. These connectors are here, 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 and here. And the LEDs are here, 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 and here. In general, I find it helpful to put LEDs everywhere I can because they are really useful, especially during bring up. The connectors I'm using for the sensors here are called Molex. And yes, they are very small, which is nice, but they're also quite fragile. So it's not a connector you will want to plug in and plug out a lot. And here is the three pin IR receiver, which has ground power and the pin that's connected to the interrupt line here. I've also added an LED here to physically see when the IR receiver is receiving a signal. 
I also put a capacitor and resistor here for some filtering, as recommended in the datasheet. And on the PCB, the I receiver is located here. In total, I have three unused pins on my microcontroller. This pin, this pin, and this pin. And I've drawn those out to header pins to be able to use them just in case. And the one I call test LED, I've connected to an LED because it's often useful for debugging purposes to be able to blink an LED. And the unused pins are located here. To program the microcontroller on my board, I actually used the evaluation board for the microcontroller because it has some electronics on it that allows you to program the microcontroller via USB. So to avoid having to put those electronics on my own board, I simply disconnect these bridges here to avoid them being connected to the evaluation microcontroller and then put my own jumper wires and connect them to my own board. Yes, this is a bit of a hassle and it would have been easier to just have a dedicated USB port that I could plug into. But it was an easy and quick way to do it and works well enough. So the pins I connect to program my microcontroller are these two here. And finally I have the two motor drivers. One for the left side and one for the right side. And as I already showed, I have two PVM signals, one for each uh, motor driver. And the motor drivers can actually take two separate PVM signals to control each motor separately. But I only use one PVM signal for each motor driver. Because both of the motors on either side should always drive with the same speed and in the same direction. Because I use tank drive, so it drives similar to how a tank drives, but without the tracks of course. And the same goes for the pins that controls the direction of the motors. These pins I've also merged together just like the PVM signals. And overall by doing this I saved some pins on my microcontroller. And similar to the other ICs I followed the example circuits in the datasheet and put some bypass caps on some of the pins here. Okay that's it for now. I'll come back to the schematic in the coming video as we write the drivers for the individual components. I also want to note that I am a beginner at hardware design, so you shouldn't look at this board as an example on how to do it. Yes, it works, but with a simple board like this, there is a lot of things you can do wrong and still have it work. With that said, if you have any questions, hate or feedback, please leave a comment below. In the next video, I'm going to get started on the software side of things by talking about my development environment. So bye for now and see you in the next video.